So we are in our sixth session together as we're going through the Catechism of the Global Methodist Church, a Catechism of Christian Faith and Doctrine. If you don't have a copy yet, you can pick those up at the church office. Um, and uh, we also have several copies on Wednesday evenings. Uh, last week, we talked about our doctrine of sin and humanity, which really wasn't in the catechism. It, it, it reminds us of our need for our Savior. And, and as we talk about salvation, and, and as Dr. Steve Blakemore talked about Jesus, it certainly we certainly uh, are going to consider our need for salvation due to our, our sin. But uh, I thought it was helpful and, and, a, and an important part of our Wesleyan understanding to talk about what we believe about sin and what we believe about who we are. We'll talk more of that, about that in the coming weeks when we look at sanctification, that we are created in the image of God. So we'll, we'll do some more work on who we are. So last week was the doctrine of sin and humanity. Uh, and today we're going to talk about our doctrine of the church. Uh, and, and I want us to be careful as we do that. And I want us to be careful as we talk about church. Uh, there are a lot of hurts in in the church, but also because of church. Some, some hurts that happen within family are incredibly painful, and friendships are incredibly painful. But you add faith into the hurt, and that is a deep, that's a deep source of pain for many of us. So I understand that. But I want us to be careful when we talk about church, because really we're talking about the bride of Christ, and we want to be very careful. Uh, obviously, the church and people in the church can do some, some significant harm, and we acknowledge that. But we want to be careful when we talk about the church. So often we're, 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 we're critical or sarcastic, but she is the bride. And so we want to be very, very careful about that. Okay. Um, as we talk about the doctrine of the church as well, uh, I'm just going to say from the beginning, we're going to talk about just the basics. This is the catechism that's to cover. Here's what the Global Methodist Church, but really, this is what the church says about the church. This is what the historic doctrines of the church has said, as well as each week we're going to give kind of our Wesleyan spin on things, or just note a few of the distinctives of the Wesleyan tradition. <laughs> Uh, so we could talk a whole lot more. We won't have time to go through what Acts says about the early marks of the church. What do we see and learn of the church in the epistles? Again, in every one of these questions in the catechism, there's a whole lot of scriptural references. We'll look at some of those today, but we won't be, have the opportunity to look at all of them. But you certainly see the life of the church in the epistles and in the book of Acts, even in the book of Revelation, what Revelation says about the church. But today, just the basics. If I were to ask you, give me a definition. Who is the church? What is the church? You might talk about the organization. You might talk about names, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. But it's interesting to me. And that's why I've, I've loved going back to Tom Oden, a great Wesleyan scholar in his systematic theology. And I love to come back to it just to show you what I had to read uh, and, and to go through in seminary. But I love what he says about the church just from the very beginning. There are many names and titles for the church, the ecclesia, the, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Um, but I love what he says from the very, very beginning of his systematic theology when it, when it goes to who, when it's speaking about who is the church. He says this, there is nothing more fundamental to the definition of the ecclesia, the church, than that they are loved by the Son, with the love willing to risk all for the beloved. John Chrysostom, very important to John Wesley, a preacher from the early century, said this, for Jesus, for he espoused her as a wife, he loves her as a daughter, he provides for her as a handmaid, he guards her as a virgin, he fences her round like a garden and cherishes her like a member as a head he provides for her as a root he causes her to grow as a shepherd he feeds her as a bridegroom he weds her as a propitiation he pardons her as a sheep he is sacrificed as a bridegroom he persevere he preserves her in beauty as a husband he provides for her support we're loved there's so many things that we're going to say about the church, so many basics. 
but but we're a people, we're a beloved. And I love how Tom Oden begins that way when he speaks about the church. What do you believe about the church? That's question uh, 27. Do you believe in the church? Yes, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Those really are the four marks for what a, what the church is. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Now listen, let's be honest. When we talk about those four words. You only heard one of them. You remember from the Apostles' Creed as well as the uh, the Nicene Creed, and that's the word Catholic, because as Protestants, as, as Methodists, we get hung up on that. Why do we say Catholic? We're not Roman Catholic. But as we talk about that mark of the church, Catholic, um, it means whole. It means the whole faith in all times and in all places. It is the church at in all times, as well as the church that holds to the Catholic, the universal teachings of, of the church. So that's what we mean by Catholic. Uh, the universal church, yes, but also the universal church that believes in what's been taught throughout all the ages. The other marks there is unity. There is but one church. Uh, there really isn't a division in, in denominations, although there were some divisions, but there was no real di division within the body of Christ within the church until really the 11th century. And we go a thousand, over a thousand years before there's division, and then it's almost another five centuries until you see that uh, again. Uh, so it's there is but one church, and really. It, I don't want to put it out on the front sign of, of our church, but we're really not a church. We're a charge in the Wesleyan understanding of things because there's only one church, the church. Uh, there aren't little churches. There is but one body, one church. And some of the, the scriptures from the catechism, you can look up for yourselves, but John 10, 16, then it will be one flock, one shepherd. First Corinthians 12, 12, for even as the body is one and yet has many members. Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body and one spirit. Uh, there's one church, his church. And uh, we're it's okay to call ourselves Madison Methodist Church, but there really is only one church. There is no First Baptist, First Methodist, First whatever. There's one church. Catholicity, unity, apostolicity. We're apostolic meaning that the churches of the apostles that were being shaped by the apostolic teachings, the teachings of the apostles, that the church was given by Christ to the apostles uh, to start. And we'll talk about spiritual gifts just for a little bit as we close. Uh, uh, and there may be some arguments over that. But, uh, but yes, we're of the apostles. We're apostolic in that sense holding to their teachings, to their uh, uh, their beginning with uh, the church. And then the fourth word was holy. Uh, Ephesians 2.21, that we're growing into a holy temple, that the church is to be transformed and to be holy. We don't talk enough about that. Theologians today don't talk enough about that. Wesley's had three significant sermons on the about the church, and one of them was called On the Church. And he talked, yes, in that sermon about ordination, he talked of, that the church is not a building, but it's a people. Uh, but he also talked about the church's moral requirements, that we are to have holiness of heart and life. We believe, as the catechism says, we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Those are the four marks. Question 28, What? who constitutes the church? The church the Christian church is a community of all true believers under the lordship of Christ. The church is the community of all. And again, uh, I want us to be careful that we we can sometimes think uh, in not just the U.S., but sometimes we can think, hey, we're, we're kind of a big deal. And uh, it's just crazy when you think about it. And, and when, by the way, you are. Christ died for you. You matter. You matter to him, and you matter to the kingdom. And our church matters. Any church or charge matters. And uh, and I love our Methodist movement and Methodist church and just the impact that we have, uh, the legacy our tradition has 
on the world and on world Christianity. But we are world Christians. When you think about the billions of Christians around the world, you got to we got to be careful. There's any kind of arrogance or any kind of elitism. Uh, but that we honor and we remember, as we did recently at World Communion Sunday, we remember our place in the brotherhood and sisterhood of all believers. We're a part of one church, and Christ is the head of the church. Uh, all believers under his lordship. And there's some great reminders there in the scriptures and the catechism, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified by Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who is in every place, call in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Another great uh, symbol we'll look at uh, later. Christ himself being the cornerstone. Uh, the catechism brings up the great commission of, of Matthew 28, as well as the we remember the kingdom mandate of Acts 1, that we're to go uh, everywhere, uh, that the church is everywhere, and we're to take the church everywhere, and then Revelation 7, um, that reminder as well from the Catechism 9 through 10, uh, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes, peoples, and tongues, so we're not just our corner of Christendom, we remember not just whose we are, that he's the head of the church, but we remember our brotherhood and sisterhood, and that's the way it's going to be in glory. We need to always keep that on our minds and our prayers for the persecuted church, but also to celebrate the diversity of the church. Question 29, what is the church? It is the redemptive fellowship in which the word of God is preached by those divinely called, and the sacraments are duly administered according to Christ's own appointment. I want to look at that last word first, Christ's own appointment. He's appointed the the uh, sacraments. We'll talk uh, more about that as well, but also I would say that the church is his appointment. It's his church and his, his plan uh, for us. He died for the church. He's appointed the church, and he's appointed the church for the place of the sacraments. We'll talk about sacraments uh, in two weeks when we get back uh, together. But there's other key terms there, the importance of fellowship, the importance of the body, the importance of relationships. We can't miss it. You don't miss it in the life of Jesus. That Jesus is routinely at the synagogues, that Jesus's family went to the festivals. Jesus went to the holy uh, festivals. You watch his life, it's not just a large group, but then you see his small group, the 12, but even a smaller group like our Wesleyan bands or covenant groups, these, these groups of three or four that you see in Jesus's life with Peter, James, and John. If we are creating his image, we'll talk more about that in the triune God's image, God of relationships. We need to be a people of relationships. So of course, Jesus has put us in a body of uh, relationships. And John Wesley speaks to that. John Wesley says there, there, there can be, uh, uh, or he says, holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Now, we sometimes hear the word social holiness. We almost think of social justice issues and issues, and we better be a people as Wesley was, who are all about acts of mercy. Acts of piety have to be connected to acts of mercy, as they were for, for Wesley, and as Christ reminds us about in Matthew 25 and elsewhere. But there's but the idea there, when we talk about social holiness as Wesleyans, is you're not going to have a personal holiness if you're not connected with others. Nobody does that well. Nobody... Nobody sees a life transformed well without others. We need their encouragement. We also need their discernment and discipline uh, so that we can see the rough edges, so we can see our blind spots, as one member of a church was talking about uh, this week with me. Celebrate recovery, alcohol anonymous, anonymous will remind you, you just don't get well alone. And so for Wesley, he required a sociality an interrelatedness to his people. You have to be a part of a society, but even to get into that, you had to have a ticket punch that you had either been in a class meeting or a band meeting. You had taken seriously your interrelatedness. 
nests. Some people want to push back. I don't need the church. Number one, Christ is head of the church. And, 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 and you see the picture throughout scripture of the importance of that body. But in our Wesleyan understanding, our method in the Methodist movement, of course, we're going to be a part of our church for encouragement, for the use of gifts. We'll talk about that. But I also, but, but, but also we just don't do well alone. If you have your second Helvetic confession, if you'll pull that out. Yeah, I don't have one either. But in my systematic theology, Tom Oden reminds us just about the danger of being alone, as Wesley did. To leave the Ark of Noah, says the second Helvetic confession, to leave the Ark of, Ark of Noah during the flood is to court disaster. To be without the plank of the church amid the stormy history of sin is hazardous, hazardous to the soul. We just need each other for encouragement, but also for accountability and for discipline. And that was Christ's plan for us. Also in the, in the confession, the reminder, and we've talked about our doctrine of scripture, the word of God is to be central. Uh, the, the word, yes, not just sacrament, not just order, but it's the word that is to be center. We've already talked about that. But also this word called, that there is there are people who are called to ministry. I shared this past week about my call uh, to ministry uh, in the sermon. I just had a cabinet meeting this week where we talked about there's not, we're not as pastors calling enough uh, of people to consider ordained ministry because there is division. We'll get into that as we close. There is division uh, in ministry. We're all called. If, if your vocation is good, God can use it and will use that for his kingdom purposes. That's the kingdom mandate. But some of us are called to a set apart life uh, for kingdom purposes. And you need to, we all need to think through that, uh, that we're called. And we're going to talk about sanct, uh, sacraments next week. But that's part of my heartbreak. And we'll talk about it next week when we're out, when we live outside the church. We don't go to church. Well, that's the avenue for the sacraments. And uh, I was preaching on assurance this past week in John's gospel. Well, these outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual grace are only available within and through the church. And what a deep assurance that was as we took communion last week of the love of God for us. And he, and he instituted that. I want this as a reminder. I want you, you know, and you read it and then Paul and elsewhere, do, do these tangible things to be reminded again of who I am, to remember me, but I also want to remind you in tangible ways of my great love for you. We can forget that. And I'm, I'm sad for people who live outside the church, say I can do, I can do life on my own. I just don't think we, I don't think we'll be who we're called to be without social holiness, without the body, but also God can't speak through his sacraments for outside the church. Um, and I will say for Wesley, when we talk, excuse me, we talk about clergy and sacraments, that's one of the very few reasons we have the clergy in Wesley's estimation is for the right handling of this of the sacraments, that we want to do that well and need to do that well. Wesley had laity doing everything, preaching, all kinds of teaching and ministry and care, but you had to wait for the circuit rider to come around with the sacraments because he, because of what we believe about the sacraments. We'll talk about that soon. Um, those needed to be handled by clergy, so make sure we do those right. All right, question 30. Those are just some key reminders about the church, uh, fellowship, sacraments, the called order of pastors. Uh, question 30, why does the church exist? Under the discipline of the Holy Spirit, the church exists for the maintenance of worship, the edification of believers, and the redemption of the world. Now, again, discipline is connected to church. Uh, now, the focus is always restoration, not pun it's not to be punitive. The goal is always to draw back to the body of Christ and to draw back to Christ. But Wesley, in his definition of church, had some great things to say. The company of men called by the gospel, grafted into Christ by baptism, animated by love, united by all kinds of fellowship. But it ends with the church also is disciplined by the death of Ananias and Sapphira. We've talked about it in sermons before, but we need discipline. We need discipline. Uh, another sermon that Wesley preached 
uh, one of his big three sermons on the church was God's vineyard. And he spoke to the need of discipline in that sermon so that we can avoid our known sins, so we can be pressed and pushed to do good, uh, and so that we'll be active in the ordinances of God, that we'll be praying, that we'll be reading, and on and on. But discipline will always, this side of heaven, discipline will always be a part of the church because it's full of people like me. And I'm a sinner in need of grace, and I need reminding, and I need accountability uh, for when I miss God's plan for my life. So the catechism gets it right. It's the discipline of the Holy Spirit, but also the discipline of the church. But also the church is there for our worship. We now worship us 24-7. We are created to worship. We're beings designed for worship. And so it's not just in the confines of a building or a space and time that from the beginning of time, we've 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 put together um, uh, uh, a, a space and time for worship, but uh, also for formal worship. We can't forget that we've got to come together. And when we come, and a preacher said this before, we come to ultimately to give, not to receive. Um, this worship, I, I hope you get something out of the sermon, but in a very real sense, the sermon's not for you. Every element and aspect of formal worship is to the glory of God first. I'm glad in his, that God in his goodness allows me and other pastors to focus on us and, and to craft sermons, hopefully, that are helpful uh, to the body. But ultimately, every every part of that, I don't come to receive. I come to worship, to bow down and to adore and to give, to bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. That's his goodness. But ultimately, as we were in John 12 this past week in our sermon, recording this here, the first week of October 2023, that everything's for the glory of the Son. Everything's for the glory of God. I have been so blessed, and I hope you, I know you have too, by our children in worship, by the music we've had in worship, by the prayers of our, our staff in worship. But ultimately, it's not about us. Worship is for him. All of it's for him. And uh, so it's for the maintenance of worship, the glory of God. Uh, but but it is a corporate response, and I think a corporate blessing, but also uh, we're uh, – I'll, I'll talk more on that in a minute. Okay. And then the other two things, to edify, to build up the body. That's why the church exists, to, to, to disciple people, to encourage them uh, in their faith. But then this reminder, and I love this, and we're going to talk about this, I pray, at the end of October, uh, that, that the church exists for the redemption of the world. Like marriage, if you think about the purposes of marriage by family ministries, part of Campus Crusade for Christ, or CREW is what they're called now, when they teach about marriage, they would say, ultimately, marriage is for the glory of God, uh, for the blessing of my spouse, and for providing a godly legacy to my children or in witness to the world. Well, none of that has anything to do about me. And now, listen, we're not to be a doormat. We matter in marriage, just like we matter in the church. But ultimately, by definition, it's not about me. And if I come to marriage saying, what can I get? I've, I've missed the heart of it. And if I come to church thinking it's about me, I'm, I'm going to miss that as well. We are the only institution designed not for ourselves. And there's a lot we're blessed with and encouraged. Get to church so you can be uh, 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 blessed and grown. Yes, but we exist in a real sense for the glory of God and for the world. Um. And no discipleship's complete. And that's why I'm hoping, I hadn't written that sermon yet, but October 29th, the Commitment Sunday, we're going to celebrate we exist for the redemption of the world. We exist to just go out boldly and witness to our faith. I've already been bought. I've already been purchased. And now I need to be caught up in the days that I have left on this earth, calling as many as I can into that love of God, into that relationship with Jesus Christ. And my discipleship, and I get a little preachy here, we've kind of separated, or I heard a preacher say recently, we've bifurcated reality in this postmodern time. There's discipleship and there's evangelism. And the, the church never did that. Evangelism is part of your discipleship. Uh, your discipleship's not complete until you're, you're evangelizing. And what he, what that pastor was saying was, um, 
uh, we've kind of made um, discipleship, and I don't have the notes in front of me. I'm sorry, I didn't write that down. Um, but we've it, we we've um, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I had that. But that, but he was just basically saying, "Is your discipleship's incomplete without evangelism?" Somehow we've missed that in our current culture, and so um, that's that's why we exist is for the redemption of the world. When we say we as a church family is our mission statement, we exist to build faithful disciples. That that means we first made them, we first won them. Now Christ does the winning. I know that, and the Holy Spirit draws them. We know that. But we need to be a, about the ministry of evangelism so the Spirit can do uh, His work. And we're supposed to be about worship. And, and I don't know if I have time here. I'm going a little bit long. Uh, I'm going to take, yeah, I'm just going to get preachy. This will be the longest one. But but worship is, is critical. Now, I want to say to you, um, and Matt Chandler says this, worship is supposed to be smelly. I know a lot of us have crazy schedules, and I'm so glad to see so many of us connecting to make that commitment. If we can't be here, we're going to reconnect with our church, and we're going to worship on the road. We're going to connect with what our church is learning through whatever the sermon or the focus is the day. I'm going to make sure to be present so I can hear the prayer requests of the day, so I can be praying for what's been lifted up. I want to know all those things. I'm going to celebrate. I want to see baptisms. I want to hear special ministry moments. So I'm so thankful. But you, we've got to be committed to that. And it's not just because of our family, but ultimately, worship's not about us. It's about him. And that's the heartbreak when we say we're going to skip out on worship. That's my heartbreak as a pastor, is uh, we're missing him. That when we have a church of over 2,000 people, but this past Sunday we could say we only got we only could scrounge up 586 people to worship you. That's the heartbreak. Uh, now we've got so many online, 100, I think 183 by the end of the day. So there's you multiply that by how many people that is, but um, that's got to be a commitment. And we're going to talk next week a little bit more about question 31 but is it right to good and good to worship our creator and redeemer it is our duty and it is our privilege to bow in adoration humility and dedication in the presence of god and so i just i don't want us to miss worship and you know there's going to be less people in worship because cultural christianity is dying there's going to be less people in worship i know because we're racing and it's a different um yeah. Uh, it's a different uh, culture, and we're we're just in an affluent culture where we've got so many other commitments. Um, I understand that, but but we've got to be in worship for Christ's sake, to honor Him, uh, to worship Him, as well as all those other things, so we can be better reach the world, so we can be encouraged in our faith. And I'll be I'll be honest, I I. Uh, I will share Wednesday night. It's an important metric for me that we need to be faithful in worship. I know we're going to be right. It's not the biggest metric for me because I just know we're racing more. I'm, I'm, I'm probably more uh, worried about how are you doing in your spiritual disciplines? Because that's uh, ultimately how are you doing your spiritual disciplines? Because the, the transformation is crazy. Lifeway research did a, uh, uh, did some work on this and found that if you're routinely in the word four to five times a week, and in your prayer life, uh, you're 200% more likely uh, to evangelize. See, that's so we, we exist for the world. So if you're, that's that's a metric I'm worried about. We've put, really put a lot of sweat and time as a staff into that. How can we help you grow in the word? How can we help you grow in your prayer life? Uh, if you're regularly in the word, viewing pornography drops 61%. Your chance for you to disciple somebody else goes up 230%. The uh, the 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 just the, these areas of bitterness or anger or adultery they just all drop drop radically because you've been in the Word and you've been in a regular uh, prayer time. So that's we that's a, if you want to hear guilt from me, I want to put you into that because I know I know your worship life and I know we're racing. So that's where we're putting our energy. Not that we don't put it into worship because that's why we exist for the worship of God. But also, do you do you do you pray regularly? pray and study regularly are you connected with the group because the numbers are there too if you're thriving in a group you're probably going to be thriving in life and then um how's your reaching how's your evangelism and serving 
uh, those are metrics we really we really look at. So anyway, that's that's a preacher got off on a tangent there. Uh, but I, I want us to do I, I want to call us. I know it may have to be on the road, but we are called we're worshipers. We're designed for worship. And I want us to be careful if we're not worshiping someone, we're going to be worshiping something. If we're not worshiping him, we're going to gravitate to someone or something. Uh, else. So just be committed to formal worship as well as your own uh, basic worship. A couple of things in closing, just some symbols, some reminders of who we are as we think about who is the church, what is the church. This isn't in our catechism, but just in some notes I've had, and I think it's helpful to give you scriptures. You can find those later, uh, symbols related in, 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 as to the church with God, that we're the household, 2 Corinthians 12, 14 through 21, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 9, 1 Timothy 3, 5, that mutual concern, that family focus, and, but also within a family, there is kind of a chain of command with children. There's kind of a hierarchy of functions within the family unit. So that's one of the understandings of church as household. Another one is 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9. It's the plowed field. This reminder of we're to be laboring as the church, that they're supposed to be yielding and producing and fruitfulness in the church. The idea of building or temple, not just a building. The 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 5, that we are, we are the building material. Uh, the living tree in Romans 11, that the members of branches and, and sometimes pruning is done, but that's to help take care of us, that we are to be 1 Timothy 3.15. There's a lot there, but also to be a pillar of truth, a bearer of truth, a guardian of truth. That's what the church is supposed to be as well. Not just a sanctuary uh, hospital for sinners, but a bearer of truth. That's a part of truth. The symbols we can find uh, in our relationship to Christ, that we're the body of Christ, Romans 12, 4, 1 Corinthians 12, many verses there, we're the bride of Christ. What a great image of the church. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 3, Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. And then we're, that image then per, reminds us of the, uh, the faithfulness we're to have, the relationship we can have with God that Really, it's the first pictures. I mean, Paul was single. Jesus was single. We all need to pray through singleness. But it, I, I love that reminder that the first pages of Scripture, the last pages of Scripture of weddings, of marriage, that God, the bridegroom is from page, from the beginning to end, the bookends are this depth of relationship that he wants uh, to have. The branches of the vine, John 15, one's another great symbol We've got to abide in the vine. And then the flock of Christ, John 10, 1, or Acts 20, 28, that we are the flock of God. I did have a teacher one time point out that another word in the Eastern church for flock is beasts. Sadly, we can be beastly uh, sometimes uh, to each other. Uh, but that's that's another great image. We're of the flock of Christ. Um, there is an organizational life. I talked to that in a, in a sermon recently to the church that there is division of clergy and laity i give you a ton of scriptures on that but you know those things that there's also division within clergy uh in some traditions like baptist deacons or laity but in the methodist tradition they're clergy uh, we could talk a lot about the qualifications for clergy in the church uh, scripture is clear on those things i think a lot of times and, and should be our most basic separation from other denominations should never be doctrinal it really should be governmental how how we govern ourselves and then how we get pastors or send pastors so you have an episcopal form of sending a presbyterial form of sending a congregational form and a non-governmental form so how we send pastors but also how we organize ourselves for how we're going to be under accountability and discipline uh, and, and if we had time, and we don't have time, I talk a little bit about spiritual gifting. There are some in the in the Protestant tradition that believe those gifts have ceased. We talked about that a week ago in our Bible study in the sanctuary. Uh, but I love that the, so many of the gifts aren't really signs for the world, but it's really, again, this edifying, this, this building up of the church. And that's okay. We exist for the worship of God. Uh, we exist to, to reach the world. But we also we take care of one another and we use our different can the foot say to the whatever that you know in first corinthians 12 we need each other 
We just need each other. And that's my hope and prayer that anybody watching this would say, I'm recommitting myself to the church, uh, to the headship of Christ, uh, to remember that I'm loved. But all these imagery of our interconnectedness, our interrelatedness, I'm going to commit myself to that as well um, for our own sake. But for our sake, we miss you. The church misses you. When, when we don't have you that's that's just some basics of the catechism i hope that was helpful to you as always email me barry at madisonmc.org or you can call the church office we can set us time to talk we're off next week if you're watching this as we produce this on october the 4th october 11th we're off for fall break um, but then we'll come back in two weeks and we'll talk about a doctrine of the sacraments. If you're reading in your catechism, those will be questions 33 through 34 and questions 38 through 44. All right. I hope that was a help or blessing to you. Again, call me with any questions and uh, we will see you in just